The High Roll Warriors is written by and produced by Sunyan Studios. You are watching the High Roll Warriors podcast with your wonderful stars and me, Apollo the Watcher, the one sending you these amazing tales. Tales of monsters being vanquished, tyrants falling from power, friends being made. We are here to tell you the story of a lifetime. A story that takes place in the world of Ezerand. What happens in our world? What will our adventurers go through? Adventurers doesn't seem like the right name for them. They deserve a better name than that. They are our high roll warriors. They believed that the end of the North Village would be the worst thing they would see this month, at the very least. But this tale is a sad one. One that breaks my heart. One that makes me wish I could intervene. Our adventurers had gone through many terrible things, but sometimes simple things can lead to destruction. They were traveling through the forest to get to Axel, the common starting place for most adventurers. Although not spoken in the first two episodes, they had a few other party members. Two that had left a couple months before now. And Rumbo. A changeling rogue barbarian. As they walked through the woods nearest to Axel, they were ambushed by a gang of orcs and goblins. This was going to be a bit of a challenge, even if they had fought a gang of orcs before. They were still just level 1. Argus went into a rage. Jonathan pulled out his long sword, and Rumbo hid to get his sneak attack. Bane and Frothen began buffing their team, and Aurora was ready to the draw. Although starting with an ambush, they still kept up. Jonathan, as usual, was trying to solve things diplomatically, but it didn't work. These orcs and goblins call themselves the last followers of Grumsh. There's no negotiating. Argus and Rumbo, hearing the wonderful sounds of Frothin's lyre, inspired them to fight more and strike harder than they normally would. Jonathan would knock out as many as he could, while the others simply slaughtered. They kill a few orcs, stab a few goblins, and it looked like the odds were in their favor. Until the sound of a threatening horn went out from one of the orcs. It smirked as a loud thump, thump, thump could be heard behind them. Aurora is grabbed and lifted up into the air. Please! Please! No! No! Someone! Marcus! Jonathan! Help! Let go! No! 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 Any adventurer who tried to help was ruthlessly attacked by goblins and orcs, brutally knocking Rumbo and Argus out. They just had to watch as their own team members would be silenced. They looked upon in terror as they saw the blood covered ogre chew, letting the bottom half of Aurora's body flop to the ground. He slurped up her intestines like bloody noodles. The orcs and goblins laughed at their fear. Frothin tried to insult the beast, but to no avail, as he was knocked out too. Jonathan, their great fighter, fell to his knees as his head was bashed to the side, knocking him out. Pain, out of complete fear, would run away and hide. For an unknown reason, the orcs and goblins never ate and stole their items. Perhaps they were driven off by adventurers in the nearby city. Whatever it was, this... This was our adventurers' first real loss. The surviving adventurers would never see Fane again. When they went to tell Aurora's parents the news, they were enraged. They took back their bag of holding they were gifted. This loss would cause Argus to leave the party, not utter despair for everyone. But they would need to continue with the smile on their face. They are heroes that are looked up to. They are our high roll warriors. The world as they know it 
as two leading religions. The Church of the Shattered God, Mekra, God of Machines, and Yaldoroth, the Goddess of Flesh. These two religions have been at war for years. Luckily, it is at a standstill. A cold war of sorts. Right now, perhaps a few years after the fall of the North Village, our adventurers would be low in cash, so they decided to visit the second known central for quests, besides Axel, known as Rimfall, the capital of Ezerand. In between their loss and now their party members, Fenrir and Penny, people that you haven't met yet because you haven't had the chance, would split off for a short while. This would be the first time our adventurers would enter Rimfall, in fact. It would only be Rumbo and Jonathan. Oh. I didn't record it. Motherfu- Rumbo and Jonathan entered the town of Rimfall. This is the first time they've seen such a large concentration of technology and diversity besides Axel. They looked around, seeing tieflings, loxodons, halflings, elves, and drow living in harmony. But besides that, there were people with augmentations and enhancements. Some people were clearly warforges, others you could barely tell the difference between life and machine. They would skip over the Prime District and headed to the Mining District, also known as the Halfling District. This name was given as most, mostly the shorter races, gnomes, halflings, and dwarves alike congregated this area, and because of this, most of the architecture fits them. They entered, seeking a meeting with the town chief of police, Mark Strongjaw. <clears throat> well, you are the adventurers for hire, correct? The man boomed. This man was, in fact, a human. Humans in the Halfling District weren't uncommon, of course. Just not as common as other races. He was very tall, with a long braided beard and mechanical leg. Clearly, the man has earned his title of Chief of Police. Romo and Jonathan answered. Yes, they were the adventurers. Strongjaw sent them on a mission to find two missing kids, and in return, 50 gold each. As well as a favor of the city. Strongjaw gave the two the addresses of the parents who had lost their children. Perhaps they could find things that the rest of the police could not. Along with this, he gave them temporary city guard badges in case anyone gave them trouble for investigating. The first victim was a halfling mother, who had her baby three weeks ago. She was tired. There were deep bags under her eyes. Her brown hair was scraggly and unkept. What do you want? The mother asked. Rumbo and Jonathan would ask if they could come inside and ask her some questions. They asked if the window in the baby's room was locked. Then they asked if, the, if they could look around. After looking around, they would only find a small piece of black hair in the bedroom. Mother, the mother didn't have black hair, nor did the baby. And the father was absent. The two went down the street to the next victim. And as they were walking, they spotted a peculiar old lady sitting on the side of the road, seemingly sleeping in front of a caravan with a black cat on top of it. They went to the next mother, a dwarven mother. She was similar, yet she had more sunken eyes, and the presumed father was in the back at the table with his head down. They asked her similar questions, and she too allowed them to search the room, in which they saw tiny paw prints on the windowsill. They walked back to Strongjaw to relay what they learned after not being able to think of anything or anyone who could have taken these children. Are there only two things I could think of? A changeling? Although that doesn't make too much sense, since if a changeling took your baby, you'd still have one. And the other option, hags. Considering they've been taken at night, you could be looking for a hag. With the new information, they went back to the lady at the front desk, the lady they had seen after entering the city hall. They went to the lady at the front desk to learn about anyone who has had children over the past month. They had a plan, for they saw a pattern. The first victim was three weeks ago, and the second was two. They concluded that this week, there would be another attack. Tonight, precisely. So they were going to stake out whoever the next victim would be. Hey, 
Hey, I would like to request any files on anyone who's had uh, who's had a baby in within the last month. Oh, dear, you startled me. S sorry. The woman had caramel brown skin and brown hair. She had little white freckles across her face and antlers like a deer, or perhaps more like a fawn. She looked barely 18. I can't... I can't give you any files, unless you're permitted by Chief Strongjaw. Oh, well I guess it's good that we have these things then. Reaching into his bag, Jonathan pulled out his badge. Lady looked at it. Oh, oh it's you guys from earlier! I'm so sorry. Uh, give me a moment. I can get that file for you. The girl scrambled to start looking through the file cabinets behind her, and after a few minutes, she pulled up a file. Besides the two other mothers whose kids went missing, this is the only other woman to have a baby were within the month. She showed our adventurers a file of a human woman with silver hair and green eyes. The name on top of the file was Cassie Scott. They got the address and wrote it down. The gold for your troubles. The two left the town hall and immediately started he started to head down to Cassie Scott's house. After all, night had began to fall. Can I help you? The woman to open the door was Cassie Scott. She seemed to be cradling a baby. She seemed tired. My name is Jonathan, and this is my friend Rumbo. Hello. And have you heard about the recent child disappearances? She says, Yeah, those poor mothers. I don't know how I would feel if I lost my little one. Hold on. Allison! Can you take care of your little brother? After a few footsteps, a girl about the same height as her mother appeared. She had similar silver hair that covered one of her blue eyes. She clearly had an arm enhancement for her left arm. I got him. Allison said, taking, uh, taking him from Cassie's arm lightly and rocking him as she walked away. Well, we don't want to concern you, but we're afraid you could be next. What? But, but don't worry, we think we could stop her tonight. But we need your permission to stake out here. Oh, oh dear. Um, I would be fine with it, but I'm not sure about my husband. I'll, I'll have to clear it with him first. He'll be coming home soon. Oh, in fact, that's him right now. Evening, gentlemen. Is there anything we can help you with? There came her husband, Mr. Scott. He had a scar on his neck and a five o'clock shadow. Sorry to trouble you, but we're wondering if we could stake out of your house? We have reason to believe that whoever has been taking the children recently will be here. The man looked at his wife and said, Yeah, we should be fine. With that, they began planning with the parents. The parents would fake going to sleep, while the adventurers would hide in their bedroom. The baby obviously slept in the same room, so the plan was to wait near the window and apprehend the evildoer. The bed looked a velvet red and clearly consisted of very soft silk. The baby's crib was across the room, opposite to the wet window. Hey mom, dad, I'm off to work. Okay, sweetie, stay safe. Love you. Love you too. Love you, dad. Uh, love you too, he replied. Oh, where does your daughter work? Jonathan asked. In the Prime District, at the Adventure Inn. She started working there a few months ago. Hmm. If she's leaving now, then it must be quite late. Perhaps we should get going to bed, love? Yeah, um, I suppose we should. The two got into bed, leaving their normal clothes on. Jonathan and Rumbo would now hide. Jonathan was able to hide at the side of the window, right at the blind spot of it. Rumbo, however, would hide in the closet, turning it to a gnome in order to hide more efficiently. They waited. An hour passed. It was nine. And then another, and another. Before eventually, the clock struck twelve. They were still wide awake. 
not letting their lack of sleep stop them from their mission. Eventually, they were proved right. As they heard the window slide open and saw a black cat hop into the windowsill. The cat would seemingly walk on air as it began walking over to the carriage. Rumble could see from the spot that there was an old lady. In fact, the old lady they saw earlier that day in front of the caravan. Jonathan finally sprung into action, trying to grab the cat while it was in the air. Rumbo would spring out of the closet and attack the old lady. He misses. The cat gro groaned and meowed as it grew in massively in size. It sprouted out terrifying tails and grew out to look like a large black panther. The cat pounced and dragged Jonathan out of the house. Outside with Rumbo, he had returned to his tree form. Stopping me is futile, young ones, the old lady mocked. She turned back around to start floating the baby in the air, but Jonathan successfully hit her, bringing her attention back to him. Look, I don't want to have to fight you, but I will. A black shadowy blade grew from her hands. The parrots wake up and try to grab the floating baby, but as they stood up, with a single word, sleep, the parents collapsed back on the bed. Where are the kids? They're safe with me. And then Rumbo says, they're not really supposed to be with you in the first place, so... The hag would attack Jonathan with her blade. The sword wouldn't lay a scratch on him physically, but he could still feel the lacerations in his mind. The cat was another thing entirely, as simply walking across the path made the fight entirely in the hag's favor. With strikes left and right, it was a wonder how the two still kept up. But suddenly, a purple bolt of electricity shot Jonathan from the back. The hag seemed to fade from existence as seemingly a new player entered the field. She had brown hair and brown eyes. Your cliche witch hat as well as a singular pumpkin earring. Please, stop at once. I, I truly do not want to hurt you, just... Let me do this, and no one else needs to get hurt. As she says that she strikes her hands on the ground as large green vines erupt from the dirt. They entangle Rumbo as, his, as he is being slashed at by Carolyn, and Jonathan is also entangled. Why do you need to take the children of other mothers? <laughs> Jonathan shouts from within the greenery. Jonathan remembered a terrifying fact about night hags. So that you can eat them? It is the only way my kind can reproduce. The baby starts floating from its carriage. It is the only way I can have my own. Jonathan summoned a translucent clone of himself into the fray and switched places with it. His sword at his side, rather than trying to be at action. He kept a steady mind, ready for anything. Why not adopt? There are a lot of children I know who need mothers. He stepped forward and his foot stepped into something sharp. Suddenly, a field of spikes was revealed to him. You really think they'll let a hag adopt a child? Alright, maybe we could set you up with the family. You don't understand. No one trusts a hag. Look, we'll help you. You just have to give back the kids. How do I know you won't just stab me in the back as soon as I hand them over? You'll just have to trust me, he said, dropping his sword. The vine started to leach back to the ground. Even if I did trust you, how do you intend on helping me? I'll be honest, I have no idea. But I promise you, I'll, I'll help you get kids. I I'm friends with a scientist, maybe she can help you. Th this just doesn't make sense. Why do you want to help me? I already told you, I'm a hag. How could I live with myself if I saw that I could help someone and not do it? You just need help, like any other person. The woman seemed to grow calmer. All of her attacks ceased. The large black cat got off of Rumbo and jumped back over to the woman, shrinking down back to a normal cat and jumping on her shoulder. Suddenly the powerful, scary facade had dropped and she rushed over to the two. Oh my goodness. I hurt you guys so much, I'm so sorry. A green glow began to emanate from her hands as the wounds from the spikes 
and the ground and entanglement had done a number on them. The woman floated the baby back to her crib, laying her down softly and even folding the blanket over her. Do you have a place we can chill and talk? Mermo asked, brushing off the dirt from his shoulder. Oh, yeah, I do. In the woods. Here, I'll bring us there. A purple spell circle started to form on the ground, carving its way through the dirt. Before they knew it, they were in front of a caravan in the woods, the same one they saw from earlier. The door opens slowly, and the lady walks in, beckoning them to follow her. Walking inside, they notice the stark difference between their expectations and the reality. They expected a small hut, and that was going to be it, a small caravan for this lady and her cat. But in reality, the inside was a manor of some sort. A large house with comforting warmth, red carpets that went up a set of stairs. The wallpaper was Victorian-like, with small cats being the primary design on them. She seemed to be standing there, uncomfortably, before disappearing and reappearing upstairs. I, uh, I suppose I'll get the kids. She said, walking into what they could only assume was a nursery. They followed her upstairs, and their ideas were confirmed as they saw a small room with three baby cribs, only one of them being empty. The wallpaper in here was a sky of blue, and puffy white clouds were, pa were, pla were placed about. The kids seemed to sleep peacefully. We don't need to do this now. Uh, what? Yeah, it's a bit late, and I want to cook us up some dinner, and then we talk in the morning. <gasps> Wait, even better! We can have a sleepover! A uh, sleepover? The witch tilted her head. Wait, have you never had a sleepover? I, uh, I don't believe I have. We'll change that. Also, I just realized. How rude of me. My name is Jonathan. This is Rumbo. Yo. Panama. My name is Panama. Well, it's a... Pleasure to be meeting you, Panama. Pan Pan. Yep, yeah, I'll come up with something. Jonathan walked down the stairs quickly and spotted what seemed to be the kitchen. He puts his He puts his back down onto one of the chairs and looked around. There are lanterns hanging from the ceiling that light up as they walk in. I I, I really don't cook often, so you can use whatever you like in here. I have pots, pans, and other variety of things. Jonathan started opening all the cabinets. Those that those that were high up and those were that were lower down. He began to get a look of the array of ingredients he had at his disposal. He sat for a minute, thinking. Then he snapped his finger as all of the cabinets closed except for eight. Out of these cabinets he would take out Utensils and ingredients he would need to make dinner. How does spaghetti sound? Bless you. W wait, have you not had spaghetti before? I haven't had a lot of foods. My hag mothers didn't really feed me much, if at all. What? Uh, well, I, su I suppose it's my fault. Uh, but either it was baby hands or the occasional fruit I could find in the forest. Uh, luckily, I eventually just learned how to conjure food. Oh, uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, it's fine. I'm away from all that now. Well, now that you are, you can taste my amazing food. I don't mean to brag, but it's pretty good if I do say so myself. Jonathan began to take off all of his armor, finally feeling as if he was safe around Panama. He would make a clone of himself to help him cook. Clonathan, as he would call him, would clean up the mess that Jonathan made, as Jonathan focused on the theatrics of cooking. Eventually, he could plate three dishes of, of excellently made pasta. The sauce was a rich red with freshly made noodles. There were small meatballs placed about and had cheese lightly grated over it, with basil for freshness. Panama, meanwhile, had been floating pieces of cloth over to the table and had been placing plates and utensils. Jonathan and Jonathan plate the food and finally... Dinner is served. Uh, 
This smells amazing. I don't think I've smelled anything so good before. Why, thank you. Well, enjoy. I have a few sp spare bedrooms. Uh, if you want, you can sleep in those for tonight. We said sleepover. We're going to have sleepover, Rumble said. Oh, yeah. Um, my room is uh, down the hall. They began to walk down the hall as the door to her bedroom creaked open. They walked inside of her cold room, a stark difference to her warm, comforting home. They saw a large king-sized bed with velvet red sheets. She had a large array of pillows, and she had a desk with a large cracked mirror above it. The room felt lonely. Sorry, it's so cold in here. Ah, uh, it's fine. Let's get this sleepover started, Jonathan said as he flopped onto Panama's bed. <clears throat> Three, two, one. Out like a torch. <laughs> this is your first sleepover, right? Yeah. It is. Then how about we do some sleepover activities? We're going to start with a simple prank. Rumble climbed onto the bed and adjusted Jonathan into the center. He was able to be perfectly quiet. No creaks in the bed. No, not even the ruffles of the blankets. He took off Jonathan's shoes and hid them under the bed. Rumble beckoned Panama up onto the bed and grabbed some charcoal from his bag. He rubbed some of it onto his hand and started drawing on Jonathan's face. He rubbed his a thumb across Jonathan's face and drew a mustache. Rumble nodded his head to Jonathan as Panama scooted up. She sat there to think before sparkling some magic and making a charcoal monocle. Uh, is that good? Perfect. <laughs> All right, I think we should go to sleep, though. I have some big plans for you tomorrow. What do you mean? You'll see. Just trust me. The next morning, Jonathan and Rumble would deliver each of the kids to each of their parents, delivering a wonderful heartwarming reunion. Tears of glee were shed, and hugs were distributed to, to, to the heroes. Pan was watching, yet unseen. She felt better about herself. There wasn't a looming, overbearing guilt anymore. Only a slightly heavy guilt weighing on her shoulders. They got back to the town hall. The girl running the desk seemed to be asleep, with her head resting on the counter. An older man with antlers, and had a similar white freckles to her, was at the desk sitting next to the girl. Rumo and Jonathan showed their badges and he let them through. <clears throat> ah, I see you've returned. Right we have. Each of the children have been brought back without even a scratch. That says they've been that they had disappeared. Good job, adventurers. Like I said, your pay and a favor from this district. I was actually wondering if we could cash in on that now. Oh, really? What is it? A town meeting. Rumbo and Jonathan stood on, stood on stage and in front of the entire town. Jonathan and Panama were panicked. He, for some reason, wasn't telling them the plan. He asked the crowd what they thought of changelings, if they believed they were mischievous creatures not to be trusted. Some people agreed. Rumbo revealed himself as a changeling in front of the crowd, letting his skin morph and change for all to see. But at the same time, he revealed that he was a Sullivan, one of the most known noble families there was. The Sullivans had their hands in the pockets of many, many uh, organizations. Yet, he asked if, if he was still a man not to be trusted. He went on about how his family has done a lot of good, but surely he's still not to be trusted. There are tears for their love, joy for their fortune, honor for their valor, yet shame for their race. Who is here so base that would be a bondman? If any, speak for those who I have offended. 
spooky yet. No one spoke up. I speak of this today because I revealed to you the person who has been doing the crimes as of late. He looked at the direction that Panama could be in, trying his best uh, to assure her that things were going to work out. She dropped her invisibility on the stage and revealed herself. Her legs were trembling with fear. She was re ready to teleport at a moment's notice. This woman, you may not believe me, but she is a hag. And you must believe me when I say this is no illusion. That's the hag? She should be locked up or better, burned at the stake. But what have I asked of all of you? To think more than just what someone is. She is like no hag. She gave the children back. And you must wonder why she took the kids in the first place. I assure you it comes from a place of love. She only wanted kids of her own, but that as a hag, she could not. Why should we forgive her? yelled the crowd. If you wanted a kid more than anything in the world, but the gods decided that you couldn't, wouldn't you still want to try and have kids? We should take her in now. Have I been void of trust from all of you? Has it not helped you in your qu quarrels? Am I not a Sullivan? I trust her. I trust that she made the right choice because unlike belief, she's not rotten. I will put my name on the line for this. In fact, my life. And with those words leaving his mouth, he whipped out a knife and stabbed it into his thigh. His blood trickled down his leg. Panama attempted to get him to stop. She even tried to heal him. Ha! Ah! The hag is healing me. But surely she is an evil woman. I do this today because I ask of you to accept her to your community. He looks at Mark. Let her prove herself at the very least. A worried Mark look at the situation and the ridiculousness of this task and looks at Panama. But he will entertain the idea. After all, the crowd seems to be in favor of it. Even one of the family's parents was okay with things. Believing that since the kids were unharmed and even happy that Panama took care of them with love and comfort. Fine, but she must work hard for this. He walks up to her and stares her down. If you so much as cause any disturbance, you will be sent to prison, understand? Yes, sir. Opening music by Niall Stenson. Music composed by Miyu, Michael Gelfi Studios, and Vince Fett. Sound effects composed by Brand Name Audio. Aurora was played by Silly Shadow. Allison was played by TD Strip. Anima was played by Jessica Morvox. Jonathan, Rumbo, and Backroad Voices were played by Apollo the Sunny. This was written and edited by Apollo the Sunny. This The High Roll Warriors Podcast is a Sunyan Studios production. <laughs>